All right, so let's get started. Hello and welcome to the Yale School of Management MBA for Executives panel to highlight the Posen Commonwealth Fund Fellowship in Health Equity Leadership. My name is Wendy Sung and I have the pleasure to serve as the Assistant Dean of the MBA for Executives program. I'm joined today uh, by Dr. Howie Fordman, Faculty Director of the Healthcare Area Focus, Dr. Marcella Nunes-Smith, um, Faculty Director for the Fellowship, and Dr. Mackay Owens, um, alumnus from the class of 2022 and opposing Commonwealth Fund Fellow. Thank you for joining us uh, today to hear about this fellowship at Yale School of Management and the significant roles our panelists, fellows, and this program plays in solving um, for inequities within healthcare and dismantling structural barriers uh, that exist within the healthcare system. Through them, you will learn about the mission of the Posen Commonwealth Fund Fellowship and its significance within the MBA for Executives program. We'll spend the next 45 minutes with our panelists and save a few minutes at the end to answer your questions. The Posen Commonwealth Fund Fellowship is sponsored by the Commonwealth Fund and the Yale School of Management MBA for Executives program, and is also endowed by the generous gift from Robert C. Posen, a member of the Yale Law School class of 1972. For those of you who may not be familiar with the Commonwealth Fund, it was established in 1918 by Anna M. Harkness with a mandate to do something for the welfare of mankind. The Commonwealth Fund promotes a high performing healthcare system that achieves better access, improved quality and greater efficiency, particularly for societies most vulnerable, including low income people, the uninsured and people of color. I wanna take a moment to thank our panel of esteemed healthcare experts for being with us today. I wanna to acknowledge where we are at this point in time. While we're on the other side of the pandemic, we continue to experience its impact on all of our lives. Thus, our panel is incredibly busy and in demand, uh, but committed to taking the time to educate us on this important opportunity to make a difference in healthcare through leadership. And now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to allow our panel to introduce themselves, starting with Dr. Marcella Nunes-Smith. Oh, thank you so much, Wendy. And let me add my welcome to everyone who is joining to hear more about the fellowship. As Howie was, was saying right at the top, we are so excited. This is a favorite topic for all of us. So we're eager to share um, uh, more about the fellowship as well as get to your questions. So I'm Marcella Nunez smith in a place of just deep honor and privilege to serve as faculty director for this fellowship. Uh, I'm a practicing general internal medicine physician and associate dean for health equity research at the School of Medicine um, and also have an appointment here at the, the School of Management uh, right now coming to you from our beautiful uh, Evans Hall here in New Haven. Um, but definitely, you know, as I introduce myself and people ask me what is joy making these days, I lead with the fellowship, working with this incredible team, um, looking at Howie and Wendy on either side, getting to work with extraordinary people like Makai um, and the rest of the leadership of the fellowship program, Dr. Rosanna gonzalez Colasso, as well as the great team uh, that Wendy leads at EMBA. So there's an a entire infrastructure here to support success of our fellows. Um, and I probably said more than I was supposed to. I think it was supposed to be name and serial number, but <laughs> you know, Wendy, you, you gave me the mic and I took, I took a chance, but it's good, to, it. it's good to be here. Thank you. And Dr. Howie Foreman, would you introduce yourself? Thanks. And I, and I will say, I probably was told that I'm supposed to have the Posen Commonwealth Fellowship background, but I am a, a maverick in this way. And for me, it's all about promoting all the students and the great people that we've had coming through the doors. And that's what ends up being my background most of the time. And couldn't be more proud um, or, as, as Marcella said, privileged to be a part of this program. Um, you know, my career has been committed to developing talent within healthcare leadership and healthcare management and educating people about health policy. And I came to be interested in health equity work really in the late 1990s through my students, um, but only really became a part of systematic efforts to help uh, advance this area and reduce um, disparities. Uh, through the work in the Posen Fellowship and working with Marcella, who is thankfully my friend of about 20 years now. Um, and we are delighted to see, I mean, the turnout we have for this 
a webinar is enormous and to know that yet there are so many more that will be able to watch this after it's taped i just want to emphasize right now we are available to you after this is over to answer questions and to make this an ongoing conversation we do not expect all of you to apply this year but we would love to begin a conversation with you now and and see you come to our program in the future so i'll turn it back over to wendy but thanks for being here thank you and dr owen if you share a little bit about yourself yeah sure good morning everyone uh, my name is makai owen i'm a pediatrician I'm based in sacramento play a couple different roles. So I am the Senior Clinical and Academic Program Director for Health Equity uh, for the UCLA UCSF ACEs Aware Family Resilience Network. So in California, we implement the ACEs Aware initiative. I'm a pediatrician at Sacramento County Youth Detention Facility, and I work with Sacramento County uh, Public Health as well. Um, my clinical and kind of advocacy focus is really on equity for marginalized populations. And for me, that's especially youth who are involved in the legal system and child welfare systems. Um, and I graduated from the program in 2022 and really excited to be here today to talk about it. Thank you so much. All right, Howie, if we can start with you. Um, as the founder of the MBA for Executives program at the Yale School of Management, um, would you share with us uh, the historical context of the inspiration to launch this EMBA program with a focus on healthcare? And then maybe also how did the Post and Commonwealth Fund Fellowship come to be at the Yale School of Management? That could take us through the next 37 <laughs> minutes. So I'll try to reduce it a little bit, but uh, I will say that this, you know, I've I've been attached to the School of Management since 2001 officially and had been working with them since 98. And in 2002, we first had very vigorous discussions and deep discussions about whether having an MBA for executives focused on healthcare was a good starting point for our foray into executive format uh, graduate degrees. And by 2003, we started the program. 2005, we seated the first class. Um, and the rest, as they say, is history. The, the intention was not to make money, grow the school or anything like that. The intention really was to take the vision of the Yale University and the School of Management to for service for society, um, for a sense of personal responsibility to those around you, the foundation of the school being that of public and private management, um, to be able to do that and direct those efforts towards healthcare, where even at that time, too much money was being spent for too little. And the opportunity set for what we could do to improve healthcare for all populations was vast. And so, so much work could be done. And our goal was to populate senior leadership ranks in all sectors of a healthcare economy with the intention to obviously improve them, better outcomes, lower cost, um, and, and so much more than that, including equity. Um, if you fast forward, during the years when the program really grew to have three separate tracks. I think we were achieving that. I think our outcomes in the EMBA program are fantastic. I, I often say to people, there is not a single graduate that I would be afraid for you to talk to. Everybody glows about what happens when they come here. Um, and so when the opportunity arose about five or six years ago now, and, and Marcella may know the better year, I lose track of that, um, for us to compete for a grant through the Commonwealth Fund to provide health equity leadership education, we jumped for it. We really did. I started my conversation with Marcella before they even put out an RFP. I said, "This is if they put this out, we should do this and we can change the world in a positive way. And just three months later, we began down a very long journey to compete for a grant and we eventually got it. And uh, the rest, as they say, is history. But I will say like our graduates from the first year through to now, our current students are fantastic. Um, they are all already having an immediate positive impact on health equity, on health care and health. Um, and we expect that those that will apply here will have that same sort of passion running through them. Thank you. 
And Marcella, as the faculty director for the Posen Commonwealth Fund Fellowship, uh, you created this incredible fellowship in this program. Um, can you talk a little bit about how this fellowship is designed to support leaders in health equity? And what are you looking for? What is the impact of this fellowship on leaders and yeah. within healthcare equity? Um, thank, thank you, Wendy. Although, I, you know, Howie was very succinct, um, uh, which, uh, you know, which unfortunately just didn't give him enough shine. <laughs> so I, I want to take just 30 seconds to, to, to really lift up that this fellowship, you know, Howie is absolutely right. It began as a conversation um, he and I had right at the graduation event of another um, great program that we have here at Yale University. And this, you know, I often say to Howie, it, it's just a gift to be part of his vision and his and, and, and really legacy making here in this program. And so, you know, it's absolutely been a, a we to, to build this uh, program and to think about it. And I would say we are at a particularly great moment now having gone through, you know, several classes and iterating and growing. And it's with many thanks to Makai and all of the other fellows for helping us uh, think about this in a in a real time learning way uh, in the program and continuing to to strengthen it. Um, so uh, so thank you, Howie. <laughs> yes, uh, with you know with the you know to your questions and uh, to, to get us you know right into it the from the inception um, and we are very grateful to the Commonwealth Fund uh, to, uh, to Bob Posen, uh, of course, we were just in meetings with yesterday and to the school of management for that investment in this vision, right? It, this is a very unique program as people who are joining us today, uh, likely have already discovered. Um, it really does begin with this principle that our toolkit in health equity can really be expanded in an intentional way. Um, and that the skill set offered, not just from an MBA, but from a Yale executive MBA is what has been missing, quite frankly, um, uh, in our conversation and in our work these many decades. And so having an opportunity to, to leverage the existing healthcare track of the EMBA program, um, to layer upon it the fellowship experience is extraordinarily uh, uh, unique. In the fellowship program itself, and there's a lot of thought that goes into that, we are very respectful. In fact, what makes people attractive to us is that uh, we, we, are, we are really seeking people who are thinking and doing currently in, um, in your careers, in your professions, already demonstrating that deep understanding of health equity, um, but also walking that walk and are really at the cusp of transformation and transformative change in your careers. Right. And so we see ourselves as being in support and in service to the goals uh, of the fellows who join us. Um, uh, and Mikai will, will, will talk more, but I can remember Mikai like yesterday when we met in this very building in the room next door to this. And I said, now this, this is a person who is going to bring great change right everywhere, a transformative leader right here. Um, and if we can do anything to help support his vision, uh, then our job is is done. Um, so that's a little bit of, you know, on, on a high level who we are looking for in the program. And then we design a curriculum to support those leaders um, already. Uh, and I mentioned before, the associate director of the program is uh, Dr. Rosanna gonzalez Colasso, who uh, is an extraordinary partner in thinking about, um, in particular, our Thursday night workshops. Um, we work very closely with Howie and the entire program on, um, on all the components, including our, uh, our immersion visits. Um, and so we have a capstone project as well that every fellow uh, participates in and does. But I would say that it is a very... Uh, I've used this word already on purpose. It's a very thoughtful um, synergy between the EMBA and the fellowship program, recognizing, of course, all the contours of everyone's lives and looking to optimize the time that we have together. Thank you. And Makai, I mean, you were in our second cohort of fellows and started the summer of 2020, which was right in the middle of uh, when uh, the pandemic uh, happened. Uh, so what drew you to Yale, uh, to the EMBA program um, and to the fellowship? What inspired you to apply, um, especially in that time of uh, turmoil? Yeah, I think for me, 
uh, frustration is really what um, drew me to apply. You know, at the time I was in an academic community practice in Florida and very intentionally working on the clinical practice and systems of care work that was really targeted and geared to, towards uh, trying to improve outcomes for marginalized kids in in an area with huge inequities and huge disparities. Um, and I really like that that work was very um, personally and professional reward professionally rewarding for me. Um, but the more that I did it, the more um, time that went on, it, it became increasingly frustrating. And I think it was frustrating because like being in that work and in that area, especially and thinking about systems of care, you really see that like the scale and the scope of the inequities and the problems is just so big. And then it felt like from a personal level, even though I think we had a really innovative uh, program and innovative clinics there, that the scale at which I was working on the solution felt really small. Um, and started to really think about kind of what I wanted my role to be um, in health equity transformation. Um, and what skills that I had and what skills that I didn't have and what I was currently doing and like where I wanted to be in the future and kind of understanding that there are some critical gaps, I think, in my uh, understanding and implementation and, and network and started to really think about opportunities that I can pursue um, that would help me fill some of those gaps and strengthen those opportunities. Uh, and I think that's kind of where I came uh, across the fellowship and like just reading the description of the fellowship, getting more information and kind of just Listen, hearing and, and, and reading about the understanding of how to think about markets and how to think about policy and how to think about incentive alignments and how to think about, you know, structurally about change in leadership or areas where um, I felt like I was um, needed more um, to become that transformative leader that, that Marcelo was talking about. Um, so that's what kind of prompted me to apply. And then I think when you start the application process and you start to have conversations um, with the people who are involved, um, and the people who have been involved in the program, uh, you know, it's really clear that uh, I think that it's not just talk, that there's people that kind of are walking the walk um, with it. And um, in the kind of universe of the fellowship, just such a broad spectrum of people who are earlier in their career, thinking about their role in change, who are senior leaders, who are transitioning. It's just um, so many opportunities to learn. And I think the structured and unstructured curriculum that kind of once I had, I think, conversations with Marcella and Howie, and especially the first year fellows, it was like, oh, this is like, it's really meant for, I felt like it was really meant for me to be there. Um, and it was like a no brainer to participate um, after that. Yeah. And at least what, from what I've observed with all of our fellows, it really is a transformative experience, not only as a leader for, uh, for what they can contribute to their organizations, but in their field as well. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, Marcella, I want to circle a look back to this a little bit. Um, earlier, you talked about sort of what the what kind of candidate um, is uh, you're you're really looking for for the fellowship. Can you expand on that a little bit more and um, provide a little bit more insight into the qualifications uh, for the fellowship and for EMBA? Um, you know, do they have to be healthcare providers? Uh, do they need to have, you know, sort of a minimum years of uh, work experience? How do we make sure that the fellows uh, receive maximum impact from participating in the EMBA program and imposing in, the fel in this fellowship? And Howie, I welcome you to step into this conversation as well, especially since you're so knowledgeable about the EMBA program. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Wendy. Yes, and how we let's tag team. Let's tag team this for sure. The um, I, it, maybe I'll talk uh, specifically about the the fellowship question, Wendy, too, and then how we we can tag team with the EMBA. The you know for the fellows, um, the the program, um, we are looking to build a community. Let me start with that within the fellowship program. So it is uh it runs twenty two months ish, and so there are first years and second years is how we refer to the to that class. We are building a community, and each year we are building a cohort and thinking about both classes, um, with intention. 
So I would say that certainly, um, even as I talk more about specifics, I do encourage people with interest to reach out, as Howie said, because um, this is a, a dynamic program. Um, and we are looking, as I said before, at people who are who are thinking differently about persistent problems. Uh, and what um, I think what keeps me up at night is when people sort of self-select without reaching out to talk to us about, is there a fit in the EMBA? Is there a fit in the fellowship? Um, the, the fellowship is layered on top of the healthcare track, as was already mentioned. We are very much seeking healthcare professionals and healthcare leaders. Um, we are looking at people who have had a chance in their career already to demonstrate their deep uh, knowledge and commitment to health equity. Um, uh, and, and so that demonstration of a track record there is going to be really vital and important to us. There are all the specifics on the website. We are looking for people with approximately seven years of, 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 of work experience beyond training, for example. But there is no requirement for people to be currently clinically active, right? The idea, though, is that, um, you know, folks will come from a diversity of, uh, of backgrounds and clinical experience and clinical training, which often is a valuable perspective to bring into this space. Um, well, one of the nice things about the EMBA and about the fellowship is we we aim to see you, right, and to see you as an individual. Um, and so even as we talk about these uh, requirements and eligibility, I would just really underscore the importance of reaching out and talking to someone here. Um, how we alluded to this earlier too, there are questions of timing, like when does the when does this experience make sense for someone? And we have fellows who we've started talking to them about this, this program um, years ago, right? Uh, and it wasn't exactly exactly the right time and has become. Um, uh, so, you know, do, do the due diligence, make sure you're checking out our website, uh, obviously looking at experiences like this, but nothing will replace that one-on-one um, uh, -on -one reach out to get a little bit more information about your particular situation. Howie? Yeah, I would just add, I think people, and you said this, Marcel, but it's just worth repeating, people self-select and they self-select for the wrong reasons. Yes. Uh, for instance, we do require a standardized test. Most often it's the executive assessment. We do not use this to judge you. We do not use this to select high scores. We just need to be able to uh, assure ourselves, the, the staff, that you have quantitative capability, that you have verbal capability. We're looking for a threshold that happens to be fairly low. Some people will sit for the exam cold uh, and sometimes do okay. Some people sit for the exam cold and do really poorly. Unlike uh, if we were using the score for some other reason, if you retake the exam and get the score up to that basic threshold, we're fine. Like we don't care about the old score. We don't care if you did poorly once. It doesn't matter to us. We just want to make sure that you're going to do fine in the program because it is a very rigorous quantitative oriented program. And I can tell you way before the Posen Fellowship, I had, uh, you know, neurosurgeons and transplant surgeons, unfortunately, it always was surgeons who would say to me, I don't have time to take the gene at that time. And my answer to them is you don't have time to take that exam that you don't have time for a program because it's very rigorous. So, so don't self-select out because you're afraid of an exam. Don't self-select out because you think that we don't think that you're uh, sufficiently interesting. On the other hand, we want to see demonstrated uh, commitment to health equity in the past. We're not looking for people who suddenly realize this is what they want to do and they want to make a career pivot. We would prefer you put it off for a few years and prove that this is the career pivot you're aiming for before you apply. And most of all, just reach out, begin the conversation with any one of us. Let's start talking about it. I, I would love to find out. It wouldn't surprise me if there are medical students or residents on the call today. You're obviously not applying this year, but we would happily look at you for three, five years, and we would start the conversation now. Thank you. Um, and I've had a few questions come through about uh, about the qualification itself. Um, is it is are we only looking for um, uh, individuals who have uh, been clinicians or um, are non-clinical healthcare uh, people acceptable for the fellowship? 
Great. So I can start. I mean, we think it's a, a great value to the cohort and the community to have um, individuals who have gone through clinical training. Now there is a diversity of clinical training. And even if you look at our alumni spotlight, you'll see the diversity reflected in who's come through the fellowship program. But that um, that direct uh, interaction with patients, we, we do think is really uh, invaluable in coming into the fellowship. And that said, um, there are many, we have no requirement for current you know, clinical activity, um, and certainly some of the ways in which uh, people demonstrate their commitment in the field, you know, has been to shift to leadership positions in administration or other roles or in other sectors that, uh, quite frankly, don't even allow them that opportunity to be clinically active. Uh, but we, but we are looking for people who have gone through uh, clinical training, um, worked with patients, um, particularly in 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 that uh, in those training years. Um, and most importantly, I mean, Howie has said it, this will be the third or fourth time, has really shown through their career actions and activities that deep investment and commitment in this area that's longstanding. Thank you. Um, and again, I encourage everyone to talk to our admissions team if you have any questions and, uh, and we can uh, continue the dialogue there. Um, Maybe to pivot a little bit, Marcella, can you talk a little bit about um, the um, uh, the opportunities within the fellowship, uh, the co-curricular opportunities? I know you you mentioned earlier there's the Thursday night workshops um, and things like that. Can you expand on that a little bit more and talk about sort of those unique opportunities um, within the fellowship? Yes, absolutely. Um, so we're uh, the, we've talked, and I'm I'm sure Makai will talk about this as well. These other opportunities within the fellowship program. I mentioned the Thursday nights. Um, that is really at the core of our co-curricular activities. Uh, we um, uh, the the we we affectionately call them the Thursday nights. I, I do want to flag for everybody that uh, they literally do happen on Thursday <laughs> nights, and so uh, and it is required um, for us to have in person participation at our Thursday uh, night workshops. Uh, they run usually uh, about two hours in duration. Again, very thoughtfully curated curricular content. There is a, a, a set of, of objectives, obviously, to be met through these experiences. And we do them in um, uh, through sort of a multimedia way. Dr. Gonzalez Colasso leads this. We bring in guest speakers. We also have opportunity, of course, for peer-to-peer -peer, um, workshopping uh, of of uh, what are really active live events for people. Again, you know, everybody coming into the EMBA, into the fellowship is leading currently. Uh, and so we wanna make sure that there is um, immediate opportunities to take back, right? And that bi-directional learning to, to occur. Um, we can also, I can ask Howie to talk more too about our uh, alternating years where we focus either on um, sort of national uh, issues in this space or local issues here at the state and are able to hear from thought leaders in those space and do leaders uh, in that space. And that is a, a real intensive immersive experience. I would also take uh, the moment to highlight just, again, this theme of how many people are here for you and in service of you, our National Advisory Committee. Um, we have the NAC. It's a phenomenal organization of committed folks who are available in between those scheduled opportunities that the fellows interact with our NAC. Um, Dr. Octavio Martinez is our chair and uh, has been tireless in his dedication to this program, and we thank him for this. Um, Bob Posen is a re resource to the fellows as well and meets with the fellows several times a year, as, uh, as is the entire Commonwealth Fund as a resource uh, to the fellows. And the last that I would make, and in, in with apologies for likely skipping and missing, would be Yale University, right, as an incredible resource uh, uh, to us. You are part of the Yale family when you come to do this fellowship. We are lucky to have colleagues all across the university who, you know, have particular knowledge and expertise in this area that can uh, serve as additional sort of mentors or capstone um, uh, uh, mentors and advisors to the, to the fellows as well. 
And it really is a community and that exposure to this broad community and, and network opportunities uh, is incredible. Um, Makai, you mentioned earlier, sort of you wanted to have more impact. Um, you graduated last year. How has the fellowship impacted your work and leadership capabilities in general and, and in a addressing disparity in healthcare um, since you started the program? So, so I think the the biggest thing thinking about it now, I realize that I only finished, I think a year ago, is that it, it really kind of changed the way that I that I think I, I would say. And for me, like Marcella was describing it um a little bit earlier, it's like right time, right place, right people. Um, and I think that kind of really was true for me. And so I think reflecting back on myself before I started the program, again, I think very passionate about marginalized communities and about health equity and was doing um, a ton of work um, in that space and especially in systems of care uh, uh, work. But I think that I hadn't really learned kind of how to think about kind of my role in a larger context and, and my role in the future. And I hadn't start yet, I think, thinking much about innovation and about the future and about incentive alignment. And I would say that kind of before I started, my thinking and my work was very much grounded in the systems of care work that I was doing for the patients that I was caring right then and right there. Whereas now I'm kind of thinking a lot more, reading a lot more, studying a lot more about kind of how is the healthcare system going to change over the next couple of years? What's likely to happen? What are the kind of incentives that are driving that change? And how can I align my work and the work that I want to do with what I think is going to happen and with those incentives, how do I speak the language to the decision makers to kind of um, sustain programs and, and secure investments? So, you know, I, I'm pretty early from, um, I think, graduating, but I think it's totally kind of changed the way that I think and the, and the way that I kind of approach problems and think about problems and think about kind of the scale of the solution. Um, and I think just kind of also one of the things that I think it made me have more confidence, um, made me feel better prepared to, I think, step into more leadership roles where I might have, might have been hesitant. And I've kind of, it's it's funny, like in the last year, being in certain rooms and being in certain spaces and hearing cer certain words and, and, and thoughts um, and the way people communicate is like, I understand more what they're talking about. I kind of um, just feel um, like I belong in the room, I would say, um, more so than I did before. Um, and so I think like, again, it's, it's only, um, been a year, but I would say, um, as a way that I think and the way that I carry myself, um, the way that I approach things, it's been pretty transformative. And I also say it opened up a new learning, op new learning opportunities for me in the sense that, you know, I think that I had demonstrated some leadership, um, capacity and leadership experience, um, uh, before starting, but I hadn't really started to think as diligently and as rigorously um, about leadership and about change management and again about incentive alignment. And so I think that this started a learning journey for me that has carried on and, and I continue to work on that development in ways that I wouldn't had have before and read different things than I would have read before. So I think it's really built up a new skill set for me um, and a new way of um, approaching learning and kind of developing developing myself. And there's lots of ways, I think, just already even in the last year that I think that that has really paid dividends for me um, and has allowed me to gain, I think, uh, more leadership opportunities and more leadership capacity and, and honestly handle them a lot better and a lot differently than I would have um, before. So I definitely like echo what Marcella was saying earlier about kind of how the fellowship kind of sees you and, and sees your strengths, but also opportunities for you to improve, but supports you, but also challenges you um, in those areas. And I think in the short year since I finished, it's been really transformative for me. Thank you. And um, I know, Makai, uh, while you were in the program, there, were, there was a lot going on in your life as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you were able to balance sort of all the priorities in your life, uh, your work, your school, your family, and then, you know, layering the fellowship on top of that? Um, what, what, what were you, what were some of the strategies you were able to employ? Yeah, it's not easy, <laughs> but I think a couple things. So um, 
you're, you don't do it alone within the context of the EMBA program, like you're paired with learning teams. And I think like my learning team was incredible um, and really supportive of one another. Um, so that um, when one of us was maybe struggling with the concept, um, others would step up and kind of not like give answers, but actually teach each other on, on those things. And there may be times when I was really underwater, especially working in public health during COVID where I'm like, hey, I'm, I'm really struggling and somebody on the learning team um, would not just help tutor me, but also pull some extra weight. And later on when they're in the situation, I would be able to do that too. So I think the learning team was was really valuable in that. Then I'll say for me, um, during COVID, I think doing health equity work in general, like many of us, especially I think in the earlier parts of our careers when we're still, I think, cutting our teeth in like the clinical and not necessarily having the leadership opportunities that we want, that it can be a really frustrating experience as you try to find your way um, and as you try to find solutions to these problems. And I will say that the way that the fellowship sees that and the speakers that we have that are just this incredible range of people and people who have encountered the same struggles that we have encountered and taken different approaches to finding solutions in their career is just like really filled our my cup all the time. And so from a time management perspective, it, it was a challenge, but uh, I never was not looking forward to coming to Thursday. I never left the Thursday sessions feeling like I wish I wasn't there. I always wish we had more time um, and the ability to engage. And that um, is not even including just the amazing conversations that uh, we had with the other fellows. And like, I really look up to the fellows that came before me. They were incredible. They were very supportive. We had really um, interesting conversations about the problems that our populations face and about our role and our thoughts and the solution. So I think that it, it never, the fellowship especially never felt like a burden. It always felt very additive and synergistic and made me really motivated um, and inspired. Um, for anybody that's interested, there's more like just tips and tricks time management wise, you know, getting up early and, you know, staying on a, a schedule and a calendar uh, with the work that I can talk about. Um, but I would say, even though um, it was a challenge that the way the fellowship was, was structured and the way um, the, e the EMBA program structures the learning teams um, made it really, really not just manageable, but enjoyable. And I think that says a lot for me coming, I'm coming from California, I'm flying to New Haven during like the, the pandemic, like multiple jobs, lots of work, the fellowship work, the capstone. And in, in the moment it was enjoyable and reflecting back on it, it was a really uh, enjoyable experience and has a really high return on the time investment for me, I would say so. Thank you. Um, so uh, Marcella, you've had a really uh, broad and national platform and Howie, you're so prolific in uh, sort of uh, getting uh, the message out there. Um, love to hear sort of your thoughts on sort of what has changed in the health equity uh, space in the short time since our inaugural fellows joined the program in 2019. Um, it's only been four years. So like Makai said, he's only been out for a year, but it seems like a lot has changed. Love to hear from you. I mean, I mean, the biggest thing that's changed is that the national conversation now includes discussion of health equity. I think, um, you know, for those of us that saw it mostly as a scholarly area of work um, and a passion for a part of medicine to all of a sudden see the pandemic um, occur and for sort of that Band-Aid to be pulled back to show this big gaping wound um, where our health equity, health disequity exists um, has been an awakening for a lot of people. It may, may not have permeated the consciousness of everybody in the country, but I do think within the practice of medicine and within healthcare, uh, you would be looked at with ridicule if you were unaware of this now, whereas five years ago, it would have been very common for people to have been unaware. So we've, we've emerged at this moment uh, accidentally in a way, but extremely well prepared to, to prepare leaders to step in and help advance the ball that is now finally on the field. 
Yeah, exactly. And I, I would, um, I agree completely. Howie. That would also be my perspective. You know, it's, it's, it's really um, sometimes surreal for, for me to show up in various, you know, social situations and people have in their lexicon, um, health equity and, 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 and really a working understanding of that construct. It, it also prompts me to say, Howie and I are both um, uh, teaching this week here at SOM. And the, you know, I, I think how you would agree with me, but there is in your classmates just an extraordinary depth and wealth of experience and knowledge. So we we nurture this within the fellowship program, but it is, um, I, I think perhaps something that we don't lift up enough is just the community that is assembled for the EMBA uh, program broadly, uh, you know, do you, it is, it should be on the list of, you know, high there on the list for reasons to, to look at, um, to look at the fellowship, but, but also to look at Yale for the healthcare track. Uh, and so even coming off of a just rich discussion this morning um, around data and the data that we need for health equity and seeing everyone really bringing perspectives on contribution to that. And that also doesn't happen by accident. Um, and so I, there is just a lot that goes into building that that full class. And I think, you know, coming now uh, with COVID and everybody's um, sort of collective witnessing and understanding, it's made for an incredibly rich learning environment, I think, among among peers and, and other EMBA students. Thank you. Well, as we uh, near our, uh, the end of our time, as a quick closing question, um, I'd love to sort of get one piece of advice that you would give to prospective students interested in the EMBA program and, and the Pose and Commonwealth Fund Fellowship. Um, we'll start with uh, Marcella, since you're, uh, since you're on. <laughs> Great. I mean, I would just say uh, reach out, right? That is the advice. Uh, if you're joining us and listening to this webinar, then uh, take that you know next step and just reach out to someone on the on the team uh, and stay connected uh, to the fellowship program. Everyone here is looking to help you um, as you make the next best decision in your career. Makai. I would say the same thing. I think it was super helpful for me when I reached out and just talk. I wasn't sure if I was like ready for the program or what qualify or um, if I should apply. And like having that, you know, 30 minute consultation was really helpful to me in making that um, decision. Um, so I think from a mechanical standpoint, I would say that I think reflecting on my experience in the last, I, I would guess, three years now since starting and finishing, it just feels like there's a lot of positive change in health equity, but there's also like a lot of negative around too. And it feels like, you know, a lot of the principles or things that many of us care about are under attack nationally and a, a lot of um, different and emerging and new contexts. And I think that one of the things that I value most when I reflect on the, the program is that um, just have a way of thinking about things and, and as it relates to health equity in the context of the past, the current and the future uh, and thinking about what the solutions to those problems are. And, and that for me is like really, really um, transformative and, and really helpful. And that, that shift in my mindset has really changed, I think how I think and how I um, attack problems. So uh, I think that the, the, the fellowship was really uh, an incredible and, and transformative um, experience and just encourage people um, to reach out and strongly consider um, applying. Howie, please. Yeah, I mean, I think there's uh, some some evidence that people overestimate what they can accomplish in a year and underestimate what they can accomplish in five years. And I think if you think of that in the context of your career right now, this will be an enormous investment that will have in incredible payoff in the long run. And so both the timing as well as the investment you make in preparing yourself to apply and to perform once you're in the fellowship, it will put you in a position that will probably give you opportunities you don't realize are imaginable. 
Thank you. So thank you all so much. Before we close out, you may want to know a little bit more about the admissions and application process. Uh, the application for the MBA for Executives program will open in mid-August, and the first deadline is October 31st. We'll have additional webinars upcoming that will highlight the MBA program and the application process and invite you to visit us on campus uh, starting in August and throughout all of the fall months. Um, the best next step to take uh, is to complete a pre-assessment through our website and or email us directly at emba.admissions at yale.edu. Um, and as all of our panelists uh, have said, reach out to us. Uh, so please do. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you. I want to thank all of our panelists for taking the time to be with us today. And thank you all for joining us. Have Thanks, a good day. Wendy. Thanks, Wendy. And thanks to you all. Thank you.